Facebook, God bless you tonight. Uh, Sister Linda up in Maine, God bless you. Sajeev in India. And uh, one of the most important things is knowing how to interpret the Bible. Um, usually many people don't even bother. They just kind of read the scriptures. And we talked about a few scriptures last week. Uh, no, not last week, but the week before about, you know, I gave you an example of what we think a scripture means, and it meant absolutely the opposite of what it said. And so you have to be careful when you're reading the word, and remember that it's going to be um, it's going to be kind of hard work to um, to really sit down and study. But everyone needs to do that. You know, everyone needs to study the Bible to so know uh, what the Bible is truly saying, because God's authority is behind truth. God's behind God's authority is not behind presumption. And so, um, okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is what does the word hermeneutics mean? We talked a little bit about this, but just to go over a little bit. Uh, the simple definition of hermeneutics is the science or art of interpretation. Um, hermeneutics is a word that is derived from the name of a pagan god, Hermes. Remember, it was, it was mentioned that this is Greek, so uh, who bought the messages from the pagan gods to mortals and translated them as it were. So the Greek word means to bring someone to an understanding of what is conveyed in another language, making it clear and intelligible, and thus, in a sense, it is translating it. Um, so many times you can misuse a scripture or make a scripture say whatever you want it to say, and that's why we have so many cults, and that's why we have so many um, people that are falling by the wayside, because they make the word of God fit their, uh, their lifestyle. They don't, they don't take the meaning out of scripture, they, they put the meaning in. Number one, it is a science because it involves the quest for truth by means of the recognition and application of audit principles of research. You and I, we have to be able to uh, take a scripture and research it, find out what it means, what is the true meaning of it, by its context. You've heard me preach this over the years, over and over and over, right? What is it? Context. Make sure you keep it in context. You know, you can take scriptures out of context and you can actually uh, make it say anything you want it to say. If you read in one part, it says Judas went out and hanged himself. If you go to another part, it says go and do thou likewise. Uh, so you can go out and, you know, think, well, God wants me to hang myself. No, he doesn't. Okay, so you have to be careful. Uh, you can go in the Proverbs and you can say, you know, take her for she is thy life and think that that's the, that's the woman that you want, you're, you're looking to date and say, ooh, see, the Bible says take her for she is thy life. And it's talking about wisdom. It's not talking about a woman. <laughs> okay? So you've got to be careful when you're looking at Scripture because sometimes if we're not taking it in the culture of when it, when it was written, and I'm, I'm very much an adamant about that. You've got to take it, and I almost say it this way, put the spectacle glasses on of Jewishness. Put the Jewish glasses on. Because a lot of things that were written were written to Jews. And you have to understand the culture. Uh, I'll give you another example real quick before we get into even more of this. But um, when it talks about, you know, in John 15, I believe it, it says, he, he, is, he is the vine, we are the branches, okay? And it says that you are a vine, okay? But, but who's he talking to? If you look in the Old Testament, the first principle of mention in Scripture of a vine or a fig tree or anything like that is in reference to Israel. And so you have to remember that when he's talking to who he's talking to, why he's talking to them, what is the purpose of his talk, what is he trying to convey. All of these questions need to be answered And so, in order to get a true biblical interpretation. Um, just like a scientist applies the laws of nature. Can somebody get me some water, please? Just, just like the scientist applies the laws of nature to search for truth, so the student of the Bible searches for truth, not in a careless or a random way, um, but by applying principles of laws of interpretation to the task. It is an art because it involves the skillful application of knowledge and natural ability to the task of interpretation. It is interpretation because it seeks to translate the thoughts and intents of the originator into the language and understanding of the recipient. So you have the person who's, who's giving the message, and you have to be... Um, you have to be aware of that the originator of who was receiving that message. And otherwise you can get in trouble. You know, and so um, you've got to interpret it properly. 
Webster defines interpretation as explaining or telling the meaning of something and presenting it in an understandable term. If you don't understand something I'm saying, stop me by raising your hand and ask me a question. This is a Bible study. That's what it's all about. It's not about preaching. It's about studying the Bible. In interpretation, you are seeking to place yourself in the rightest shoes, and you're setting aside any preconceived ideas with the ultimate goal of arriving at the author's original intent. And that's the grammatical, historical interpretation of Scripture. There are different methods, and we'll get into that, different ways that people interpret Scripture. And what we found is, is that when people don't, when people go away from the grammatical, historical interpretation method, they start to get into um, um, the allegorical or the, or the uh, mystical interpretation of Scripture. And that's where we get the David Koresh's. That's when we get the, you know, the, the, the Jim Joneses. And that's when we get, all, we get into all kinds of cultic uh, teachings and people get away from the Bible and they get into trouble uh, because they, they begin. Now, I'm not saying that there's no allegorical uh, interpretations. There are allegorical methods of interpreting the scripture, but that's when it's something, something that is symbolic, not something that is literal. So when we're reading something that's literal, okay, uh, you can't, you can't you put an allegorical method of interpretation on it. And we'll get to that. First and foremost, A biblical encouragement toward uh, hermeneutical interpretation or study can be found in 2 Timothy 2.15. Could you put that scripture up, please? 2 Timothy 2.15. I think you're going to enjoy this because it's going to help you to understand God's word a lot better. And plus, it keep me on my toes. You can check and make sure that I'm doing my job. Okay. But you know me, I'm a stickler, so I try to make sure I'm, I'm preaching and teaching the truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay. The Bible says what? Okay, well, let's stop at the first word. <laughs> study. What does it mean when you hear the word study? What does that mean to you? Hmm? To read? Okay. Huh? To learn? Analyze? Study is work. <laughs> it's laborsome. It's a lot easier today than it was 20 years ago. If you go in my office, you'll see all kinds of uh, lexicons, and you'll see all kinds of Greek helps, and, and uh, eight, ten volume uh, Greek word study books, uh, because before it was available on the computer, which is so easy to access now, you had to look up everything. You had to diligently you know, go through methods and books, and you might have to go to three different books to get what you're looking for. Today on the computer, you just type it in, Google it, and bang, it comes all over the place. And so it's easier today. Uh, one of the things I shared with Darren, and I think I might have shared with, with a few others, is um, on the website, if you have a computer, is what's called the Blue Letter Bible. And the Blue Letter Bible, I'll tell you, it is so, so uh, much information. And it's got uh, Strong's, I don't think it has, yeah, it has Strong's Concordance on there too. Uh, but that, that's kind of easy way out. You know? But he says, to study to show thyself approved to who? Okay. Study to show yourself approved to God. Because the one that you want to please most and foremost, and the one that you want his authority behind what you're saying or what you're learning is God. So you have to study to show yourself approved to him. And look at the next word. It says, a what? Workman. It's work. It takes time. It takes, it takes effort to study. It takes time to sit and be disciplined and read and to, and to look up words. Sometimes you may not know what a word means. You can't just guess what it means. You've got to look it up. Um, and uh, I remember a little story of a friend of mine, uh, Ed Aruda, and his son, Stephen, when he turned seven or eight, his father was going to buy him a Bible. And he asked his son, he says, okay, son, 
He said, I'm going to take you to the Christian bookstore. I'm going to buy you a Bible. What Bible do you want? And he said, I want a King James Version, Dad. And his dad said, but son, you know, you're, you're only seven. There's a lot of words in there you're not going to understand. He said, that's okay, Dad. I'll look them up. He said, you sure you don't want an easier version? He said, no, Dad. He said, what do you have? He says, King James. He said, well, that's exactly what I want. So in other words, we can be lazy or we can be a, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice what it says. Not to be ashamed. You know, one of the things you, you don't want to do is go around saying things and speaking things about the Bible and be wrong. And someone come to you, and especially someone that's older in the Lord or somebody that knows a little bit more and says to you, hey, you know what? You're not interpreting that correctly. You'll be ashamed. You'll be like, wow, man, I, you know, I, didn't, know, I didn't know that was what it didn't say. You know? And so um, be careful how you interpret the scriptures because if you're just uh, kind of given the meaning of it off the cuff and you don't know the original word, you know, like uh, I'll give you an example. And many of you probably have read this. It says, wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. And if any, any of your husbands do not obey the word, you with your chaste conversation shall save him. I think it's in 1 Peter chapter 3, if I can remember. Okay. Well, what does that word conversation mean? Well, yeah, because I've told you. Not because you looked it up. But if you read it, it says conversation. You would think it's a dialogue. And that's when you know wives get in a lot of trouble because they keep getting on their husbands all the time. And it's not a dialogue. It's by your lifestyle. Conversation in the old English meant lifestyle. It didn't mean. So you have to know that the, the words that what you're talking about, otherwise you're going to be saying, no, I talk to my husband all the time, and I tell him what's right, and I, you know, I really straighten him out. No, it's not by your conversation. <laughs> okay. It's by your lifestyle, how you live your life. If you live a godly life, if you're, you know, you're doing things that you need to be doing as a Christian, and so your light will shine before him, and he'll see that, and he'll come to Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. Biblical, human, uh, biblical hermeneutics differs from other hermeneutical forms in several ways, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Biblical hermeneutic deals principally with applying hermeneutical principles to the Bible. We're going to get into those principles. Biblical hermeneutics deals with interpreting words from God to man as opposed to other forms that seek to interpret communication from man to man. You have to understand. How many of you believe this contains the Word of God? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you believe that this is the Word of God? It's not, it doesn't just contain it. These are the words of God. Okay. God has spoken to man. God has given inspiration to man. And men wrote it. You hear all the time an objection when, people, when you talk about the Bible. Oh, man wrote the Bible. Well, that's true. Man did write the Bible. God didn't take a pen and just scroll a, a, the letters up in the air. Yes. So how did God write the Bible? Anybody know? Paul, yep, the Apostle Paul. But how he wrote the Bible is through communication of the then known world. Whatever the language was is what he speaks. Do you know that God speaks every single language? That when he's speaking to a Nairobi person, he speaks in Nairobi? If he's speaking to somebody in Kenya, he speaks Kenyan? If he speaks in um, Indonesian or uh, Phil, uh, I won't say Philippians, but the Philippines, he speaks their language. If he's speaking to someone in China, he speaks Chinese. If he speaks in Japan, Japan, he's speaking Japanese. God knows every single language. So language is not a barrier to him. But how does God speak to man? 
He speaks through words. He speaks through sentences and paragraphs and verbs and nouns and adjectives and pronouns and uh, every structure of word that we study. That's how he speaks to us. So if you, if you, if you um, want to study the word, you're going to study the very words that God has spoken to man. It's through the inspiration that he came and he gave man. So man was there waiting and just sitting there and meditating on God, and God would speak to him, and he would write down whatever God spoke. And he, and he inspired him. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. When Paul spoke, and I taught, I, we taught about this in Romans. I think it was in Romans, where he said, um, uh, no, it's in Timothy, I'm sorry. He said, endure hardship as a good soldier. Well, where did he get that from? Well, God inspired him, but how did God inspire him? Well, there was a soldier that was chained to him for eight hours every day. And he saw the endurance of that. And God inspired him and said, use that. He said, endure hardship as a good soldier. And so God used natural things to bring across spiritual truths. And so when he, write, when he wrote the word, he wrote it in words, sentences, paragraphs, so that you and I, in, in whatever language we're in, can understand those things. So in order to understand those things, just like when you were a baby, right? You were born and you, you, were, you were a baby and you walked around, you know, and you were stumbling around. And the, what was the, I mean, even when uh, 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 Vicky brings her granddaughter in, right? And she's there and she's like, she, she's not talking. Okay, we think they're trying to talk. They're not trying to talk. They're just making sounds. They don't know how to talk. Okay, and they're like, and so, you know, unless, you know, you can understand, then you have, a, you have an interpreting skills that no one else has, because I, I can't understand. Okay? But what has to happen to that baby? She has to learn. And she's going to form words, right? And you're going to say, oh, mommy loves you, daddy loves you. And he's going, dad, dad. Right? Right? They're going to hear, and they're going to start to learn that's Tata. That's Mama. Okay? So that's how they're going to learn. And what's that? That's a word. Then they're going to learn more words. And, and some babies need to be careful that they don't learn some certain words that some certain people use. Okay? But that's how communication is. And that's what the art of interpreting with, with the meaning. I also know sometimes when you're texting, Okay, you can be texting something and somebody can take that so all so off, man. They can think that you're angry or mad. And you know, I know when somebody's mad because they they type in all capitals, you know. <laughs> but that's communication. But that's not the that's not the best communication. Texting is not the best communication. It's becoming a social, you know, way of text yes. <laughs> okay, so if you get a text from Lucy and it's all in caps. It's because she really can't see that well. It's not because she's angry, okay? So don't think she's angry. She's just, a, now see, this is what's cool. Okay, She just interpreted what she does. Okay, She's just telling everybody, listen, if you get a text from me, you need to interpret it correctly. It's not because I'm angry. It's because I can't see. <laughs> okay, so now you know. There's, there's what we talked about, but there's also the interpretation of what she said. Amen? So first and foremost, a biblical encouragement toward hermeneutical study is found in 2 Timothy 2.15. We just talked about be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. We must be diligent. And this means that we must exert ourselves with earnest diligence because there are obstacles and difficulties involved. One of the most difficult things you can do is sit down and get ready to um, you know, find out what scriptures mean and somebody will come, okay? Somebody will come and tell you, oh, that means this in your head. And it's a spirit of error. The devil doesn't want you to know truth because you, when you know the truth, it what? It sets you free, right? So he doesn't want you to know truth. Even from the very beginning, Satan twisted the very words of God. He was talking to Eve in the garden. Hath God said? See, Eve, 
you didn't really get the interpretation right of what he said. I'm going to show you the interpretation of what he meant. See? And what happens is, is that that's why we have so many false teachers out there. And I'm telling you, I mean, we're going to get into this, but I was studying this, and as we got into this lesson, this particular author here makes a statement that I don't believe is true. And I said, I'm going to research that. So I went out and I went back and I looked up uh, Josephus, uh, who was a Jewish historian back in the days of Christ, uh, because he quoted him. And I said, but you know what? They're interpreting this particular scripture. He's interpreting this particular scripture based on a man's commentary. So um, I got something here somewhere. Can I put it over here? Here's a whole background on Flavius Josephus okay, that I did. Okay, and his early life and everything. He was weird. Okay, and so he says something in the scriptures, and he made a he made a comment about it, and so they ran with that. Your NIV, your, I think your NIV, uh, some of the newer translations and all that translated the way he says it should be translated. But I don't believe that. So we'll get into that later. So the Amplified says to study. The NIV says, do your best. NLT says, work hard. But we must do it to please and be approved of God. And we must use the ways that God has intended for us to, to, to do to get the proper interpretation of Scripture. Now, there are some things in here that are easy to understand. And I believe that, first let me preface this, I believe that anybody can understand the Word of God okay, on the basic level. On the basic level, anybody can understand that. Okay. So, anybody wants to know how to get saved, basic level? Yep, you can read the Word of God. And we knew a girl, a lady, uh, Rose Marie, that she couldn't even read, and she learned to read by reading the Bible. Okay. And there were certain things she understood, and there were certain things she she couldn't understand. So, there's going to be things in here that it's going to take really in-depth study to understand, especially when you come into the areas of prophecy. Or you come into the areas of, of uh, uh, some of the words that are uh, metaphors or they're symbolic. Uh, you know, you've got the lions with eyes on the sides of their heads and flying wings and stuff. You're going to go, like, what the heck is all that stuff? All right? So you're going to have to really do some in-depth studying on that to find out what the author really meant. And then there are going to be some things that we'll never really know. Okay? To give you an example, um, and I was talking to Pastor Ron when he was here because I was talking to him about eschatology. And, and I really like eschatology. I like that study. And um, we were talking back and forth. So he says, well, I've kind of taken just the back seat. I don't really get into the different eschatological view. And I, and I started to explain to him different things. And by the time he left my house, he was like, man, he says, you got me rethinking that I better take a position. I said, yeah, you better. Uh, because, you know, there's pre-tribulation, then there's mid-tribulation, and then there's post-tribulation, and then there's a partial rapture theory. Only those who are really, really, you know, saved are going to go to... Uh, so you got all these different views. Well, they all can't be right. Okay? And so you have to look at the Scriptures and say, okay, what does the Scripture say? These other views, look at the other views and say, okay, these views are saying this, but... How are they interpreting the Bible? Many times, post-tribulationists, those who believe that we're going to go through the tribulation, they interpret the scripture with an allegorical method. When you interpret it with an allegorical method, you can get into all kinds of trouble, and I don't believe that's the, that's the correct way of, of doing it. Because the only way that they can interpret that is by making Israel the church. So they substitute the word Israel for church. And my question to them is, what gives you the right or the authority to do that? And they can't answer me. Says, we don't have the authority to change scripture. You can't assume. You have to make sure you know. Amen? So we must do it to please and be approved of God. We must be willing to do the work of it. And when it comes to the word, you must see yourself as a worker. This is your livelihood. Paul speaks of laboring in the word. Look at 1 Timothy 5.17 for a moment. 1 Timothy 
It says, let the elders that rule well counted worthy of double honor, especially they who what? In the, and doctrine. It's laborious. It's work. To labor in the word and doctrine. And that's why you got Christians say, well, I don't believe this, and I don't believe that, and I don't think, I don't think, this, and I think it's okay to do that. <clears throat> Just think about that. Think about that. People, people will make the scripture say things in order to justify their lifestyle. Well, disciples drank wine. We can drink. Well, if you drank their water system, you probably drink wine too. Okay? But you need to study that out. Well, Jesus drank wine. Really? How do you know that? How do you know it was fermented? Well, first of all, you have to go back into history and search. I'm giving you an example now. Was Jesus a Nazarite? Yes. Did he have a Nazarite vow? Yes. And you could tell because his hair was long. A Nazarite vow is you don't cut your hair. Another Nazarite vow is you would drink you would you would drink no strong drink or liquor. So if you go by that, somebody could tell me that Jesus drank wine, and I'll say, No, he, no, he didn't. Did he have communion with them? Yes, he did. But did he drink it as a pleasure on the side? No, he didn't. He was a Nazarite. So the things like that that you have to under, you have to go and you have to really dig in and find out what the truth is. We must rightly divide or be accurate in our use of the word. To rightly divide means this: to cut straight. And this implies that there is a proper interpretation of what is being said. Other translations state it this way. Ever cutting a straight edge or path for the message of truth. I'm not going to go into reading all of those. But the Amplified says this. This is good. Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, Correctly analyzing and accurately dividing or rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. When we do not rightly divide the word of God, we can end up being ashamed. Why is the application of hermeneutical principles necessary? Whenever something hinders the spontaneous understanding of any type of communication given, it is common when dealing with cross-cultural or historical communications for gaps to exist between the interpreter and the materials to be interpreted. We've talked about that. Sometimes the culture is different. The, uh, the Jewish culture is different. And you've got to understand it with a Jewish mindset in order to understand what he's talking about. There are several possible gaps that can occur between the sender and the receiver in communication. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about them. Okay, I'm going to give you four of them. Number one, what's called the historical gap. And the interpreter is separated from his material in time. There is a historical gap. Some of the material in the Bible was written as much as 4,000 years ago. So when you have that gap, it's very difficult sometimes without knowing the historical background of what you're reading. Second, there's what's called a cultural gap in that the interpreter's culture is different from that of his text. There is a cultural gap and most of us in the modern world do not know that, that much about sheep herding and farming, especially in the way, well this thing's popping, that was done centuries ago before modern machinery and farm equipment. So there's a, there's a lot there about sheep when he says, my sheep know my voice, what does he mean by that? Huh? 
Okay, but where did he get it from? Where did he, where, he didn't just pull those words out of the sky. When Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, when he, when he was talking to his disciples, and he said, my sheep know my voice, where did he get that from? Yes, Jen. Right, when he was using that as an example, he said, my sheep know my voice. Because they would have understood, okay, the Israelites would have understood about sheep and hearing the master's voice. Because when a shepherd, okay, was, was in Israel, he never, he never um, was shepherding his flock from behind the sheep. He wasn't driving them. Butchers drive. To the market, he would lead them. Now you you would see if in the Jewish culture, when you study the culture of this, you'll have a, a field, okay, and there'll be uh, ten shepherds with ten flocks, and they would all get together and they'd all mingle together, okay. But when one of the shepherds was ready to leave, he would, in his language, whatever it was Hebrew or Arabic or whatever it was, he would tell his sheep, "Come," and he would start to walk. And his sheep knew his voice. You see, the, you see how the, the depth of meaning that is there? And as he would walk away, all of his sheep would come from all the other sheep, and they would come out, and they would mingle from out of them, and they'd come and they'd follow him. And so that's what so when he was talking to his disciples, they knew exactly what he meant. Okay? That even though you're mingled among other sheep, or you're mingled among other things, or other things have your attention. When I speak, you'll know my voice. Okay? So you see, you see the, the depth of knowing the historical, uh, the cultural gap there? Uh, then there's what's called a linguistic gap, in that the text is using a different language than that of the interpreter. There is a linguistic gap. I'll give an example. Uh, I think I... You and I, over the, over the years, we, we understand, and I probably taught on this, so you're going to probably know the answer. Because it's, it's so funny because um, I remember Kathleen when she went to school, and she was, in, um, she was up at, um, what was the school? She was Gordon, right? She was up at Gordon, Cornwall. And um, she was in a class, and the professor says, who here knows uh, what the anthropomorphic expression is? And nobody in the class knew but Kathleen. She put her hand up. And she, and she gave the she gave the meaning of that, and he said, how did you know that? And she said, you have to know my pastor. Okay. Uh, because those things are very important, okay? And so when you have a, a, a linguistic gap, uh, if you don't know, and I'm not saying that you have to be a Greek scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar, okay? But I have the references and the availability to find out what certain words mean and what their tenses are and what their moods are, uh, we were somewhere. The uh, uh, I think we, yeah, we were at the uh, the prayer meeting on Thursday. Uh, Pastor Ron and I up in uh, Pawtucket, and there was a gentleman there, and he was saying that you know every day we got to get up and put the armor on. Every day we got to get up and put up put the armor on. Okay, and I just sat there because I know that he didn't study that. And and. Because there's, there's a linguistic barrier there. He doesn't know the tense of the verb or the noun or whatever it is. Okay, he didn't know what that, that, that tense was. So when you read, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy, that word put is in the present imperative in the Greek. And it means to continuous, I'm sorry, it's an aorist tense. It's not present imperative. It's aorist tense, which is a command to do it once and for all and keep it on. Because he says every day when you get up, you know, put the armor on. So apparently you took it off. So who's guarding you while you're sleeping? Okay, a soldier always slept with his armor on, especially when he was when there's a time of war. Okay, and you're in a time of war. You should never be found without your armor on. So when you put on, so what I'm saying is, you you have to understand that there's a there's there's a difference between just reading it in the English. Put on the whole armor of God. Okay, in the morning I've heard. Famous preachers on TV. When you get up in the morning, 
Make sure you put on the breastplate of righteousness and you'll put the helmet of salvation on and gird your loins on, you know, with a sword. And, you know. No. No. It doesn't mean that. It means that you put it on and you keep it on. And so when you, when you, when you know these things, you know, you just get a chuckle sometimes because you just say, well, people don't understand. They don't know. There's nothing that's going to send them to hell, but, you know, it's just proper interpretation. Uh, another, uh, I'll give you another example of linguistic gap, um, a grammatical gap, is we all, I hate this thing when it pops like this. Um, I must be full of, I must be electric man or something. Static man. I must be static man. Uh, you read in Ephesians chapter 6, I believe, right? Uh, or is it 4? I think it might be 4. Okay. And he gave some pastors, some prophets. No, he gave some uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, right? And how many of you have heard it called the fivefold ministry? Right? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, right? <laughs> Right? How many of you would believe that's a fivefold ministry? No, because I taught it before. Okay? Okay? But if to, the, to the normal person reading that scripture, right, you count apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. That's five. Without knowing the what's called uh, Granville Sharp's rule of Greek, without knowing that, you would assume it's five. But when you know that, and what is Granville Shop's rule? When you have a noun that's preceded by an article, okay, and you have two nouns with a conjunction, the first noun has the article, the second noun doesn't have it, then the second noun is a further description of the first noun. What the heck did he just say? Okay? In other words, I'll give you an example. And he gave... Ephesians, right? What, put that up there, would you? Ephesians chapter, what is it, chapter 4? I wasn't going to go there, but I, I feel to go there. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I'm not going to get into a, uh, an argument with somebody. If they want to call it a 5, they, can, they have every right to. I mean, you know, they, well, they don't have a right to, but they can if they want to. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, not fellowship with somebody because they say it's a fivefold fold, five fold ministry. I won't do that. But, uh, you know, I just tell them you need to look at the Greek a little bit. Where is that? 411, right? Okay, put it up there, 411. And he gave some, that's the, that's the definite article, some. Apostles, that's the noun. And some prophets, same thing, and some evangelists, and some pastors, noun, the conjunction and, but teachers doesn't have the definite article some. Now, if he would have said some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers, that would have been a fivefold ministry. But because that word some is not with teachers, with a conjunction and, the pastor is a further, the teacher is a further description of the pastor. And can I tell you that? For years, pastors have been just preachers. Except if you were Baptists, because the Baptists have real good, strong teachers. The pastors, they understand this. And so the Baptists were very, their pastors were very much in teaching, like Charles Stanley. He's a teacher. He doesn't just preach, but he teaches, because he understands that. But in Pentecost, the, a lot of the pastors, they're just preaching. And you leave out all pumped up and all great, you feel great, you know, and, and you know, and they're preaching, and they get you elevated emotionally, but you don't learn God's word. So the pastor teacher, and, and there's nothing wrong with preaching, but to have that as a diet all the time, you won't grow. A way a person grows is through exegetical preaching, preaching the word of God. That's why the devil doesn't want people in the word. That's why if you look in a lot of the big churches today, the mega churches, they tell stories. They tell stories and anecdotes and all kinds of things like that, you know, that, you know, and, and hot warming stories of, of testimony and stuff like that. But they're not exegetically exegeting the word. It is the word that it gives life. It is the word that gives life. 
And so I just thought I'd throw that in. So then the, the fourth um, um, gap that can be caused is the geographical gap. And in that, the document originates in another country from, an, uh, from the interpreter. There is a geographical gap and biological gap, a gap. In other words, I'll give you an example. Example of, um, I'm going to quote, Heath in the wilderness and tumbleweed Christianity. Jeremiah 17, 6, For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land not inhabited. The heath is a bush related to the juniper that often grows where nothing much else grows. So it doesn't mean That you're going to go through a wilderness experience. It just means that if you're compared to a, a if you're compared to that heath bush, is that you'll be able to grow in the most driest places of your experiences in life. No matter what you go through, don't think for one moment that God's not with you and that you can't grow. Here, the apostle Paul was in prison. You know, he his hands were tied. He he couldn't go where he pleased. He couldn't go preach. But guess what? If he would have, we don't know if we would have had all of the New Testament books that were written by Paul. But because he was in prison and he had time on his hands, guess what? He could sit down and he could write. So see, what looks like to be something bad was actually something good. Amen? So the goal of biblical hermeneutics is to ascertain as closely as possible, the meaning intended by the original author. We want the interpreter to remain under the authority of the text instead of imposing his or her meaning onto the text. If we can accomplish this, we can hear God speak to us through his inspired author. So was that the last one? Let's see if I want to get this. Okay, for an example, and this is a big one in our time that we're living in, interpreting the U.S. Constitution. Okay? Now, conservatives believe that it should be interpreted the way the founders meant it to be. Liberals have an evolutionary view of the Constitution in that it should be interpreted the way the majority feels it should be interpreted in their day. There are those that feel the Bible needs to be brought up to date to suit modern views and lifestyles. And we saw that when the, NI, when the Zondervan, I think it was, the Zondervan Bible uh, Publishing Company wanted to make the gender neutral Bible. They wanted to remove all gender from the Bible. Male, female, all that stuff. What happens when you do that? You have chaos. Then he can be a she, she can be a he, God can be a she. Hello? But it didn't go through. Okay. The same with the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution was not meant to be interpreted by the way that people feel it should be interpreted. As much as we hate the American flag to be burned, okay, under the Constitution of Free Speech, they're allowed to do that. They're allowed to burn the flag. Now, you and I will shake our head and discuss that it shouldn't be so. But this country has fought for the freedom of the constitutional rights of everybody. And so they have a right to do that. Is it wrong to do that? Should they not do that? Yeah, they shouldn't do that. Okay. Freedom of speech. You should be able to speak your mind, okay, and the government not tell you what you can and cannot say. That's dictatorship. Some countries, if you say the things that you would, these people would say in, the, in this country, you'd be killed.
Just like that senator that said she wishes that Trump would be assassinated. Okay, that woman should be arrested because that's a direct threat on the President of the United States. Now, if she said something like this, I wouldn't mind very much if he got assassinated. And that's a different story. That's a freedom of speech. That's your opinion. You can speak your opinion. But if you say, I hope somebody assassinates him, you're inciting someone, you're giving the inclination of someone to go out and assassinate the president. That's wrong. So there's, there's a freedom of speech. It's your constitutional right to speak up. If you go on YouTube, you'll find people, preachers, that are on street corners that are being arrested, okay, because they're saying that they can't do that. They have every right to do that. It's freedom of speech. They can go and speak about Jesus anywhere. They say, well, that belongs in the church. No, Jesus said, and he has final authority that for me to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say go into the church. He didn't say go into the synagogue. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel. So I have God's divine authority. Are you greater than God? No. Shall we obey man or God? Now, we don't want to, we don't want to you know, be rebellious to the authority. We don't say, I don't care what you're going to say. I'm going to do what I want to do. No, that's, that's a wrong attitude. No, but if you kindly say, I'm under, a, I'm under God's authority, and he's, he's commissioned me to go and speak the, the gospel, shall we obey God or men? You're being respectful to authority. And most of the times, these preachers that go to court, they win, the, they win because it's their constitutional right. And a lot of, a lot of the officers don't know their con the constitutional rights of people, or they don't think you know. So the Constitution is not something that should be interpreted uh, uh, through society, because as society gets more denigrated, as it gets more ungodly, as it gets more away from God and kicking God out of everything, they want to interpret the Constitution now to the point where if I say that homosexuality is not normal, that they want to arrest me for a hate crime? Who am I hating? I'm not hating anybody. I'm just making a statement. Homosexuality is not normal. Where do you get that from? Because the Bible says in Romans that they changed the natural, the natural use and turned it unnatural. I mean, come on. We, society has seeped so far to think about this now. They have gotten so degraded that they think that that's normal. And it isn't normal. Just the anatomy of a man and a woman will tell you it's not normal. Yes. Then they're saying I'm judging. Right. That's another misinterpretation of Scripture. Okay? I'm not judging. That's a fact. That's right. Well, say, say, they, they say that the Bible's full of hate. You know, because they, but see, we've allowed society to dictate okay, what the Bible, what we can say and what we can't say. And that's not right, because we have a constitutional right to speak. Okay? I mean, when I was growing up, kids made fun of me and, and made fun of you too. Okay? Right? And we either bopped them on the head, beat them up or whatever, or just walked away, or, you know, we took it. Um, you know, we should say that saying when we were kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Today, you call somebody a name, they gotta have a safe space, they gotta they gotta go and they can't have their tests anymore in school, they gotta have they gotta cancel school, they gotta cancel the test. You know what I mean? They gotta have counseling. I mean, come on. Well, you, you know what has caused that is society. Society has caused that because they're interpreting things the way that they're not meant to be interpreted. And they're giving meaning to things that don't mean anything. Just because you and I disagree on something doesn't mean that we can't still be friends. Just because you and I disagree, on, we can talk about things and discuss and dialogue with each other and go back and forth with each other. And we're going to find out, hey, you know something? You said something that I didn't know. And I learned something. And you're going to say, you know what? You said something. You know, And it's the same way with... Um, Brother Diamond and I, when we were talking eschatology one time, you know, he said, well, you know, yeah, he gets, you know, well, you got, you uh, pre-tribulation period, all escapists. And I said, okay. And 
First of all, I said to him, no, because that means something different. Escapist, a, a person that's an escapist is one who just doesn't want to get out of their bills, don't want to be here no more. You know, they're just tired of living, all that stuff. You know, that's the type of an escapist. They just want to escape their responsibility and accountability. And I'm not one of those. And I, and I told him, I said, see, I said, that's, that's where you post-tribulationists get, get it wrong. Not everybody's like that. I said, I'm, I'm not one to uh, want to escape my problem. But I am one that the Bible says that I'm going to escape the, judge, the wrath of God. Thessalonians says that we may obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. And I was talking to Pastor Ron about that scripture too. And I mentioned it to him. I said, first of all, who's he talking to? See, you've got to go back and learn how to do it properly. In Thessalonians, when Paul said this, he said, he said that you may obtain salvation. Uh, what's that scripture? God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, first of all, it can't be salvation as far as getting saved. Right? It can't be that because he's talking to the Thessalonian church and they're already saved. Do I have agreement here? Uh, some of us are, someone was looking at me kind of weird. In Thessalonians, Paul is talking to the Thessalonian church, the believers. And he says to him, he says to them, God has not appointed us, plural, us, him included, who is a Christian. He's not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. So that's not talking about salvation. They're already saved. He's talking to them about being saved from the wrath of God. Not appointed us to wrath, but to have salvation through Jesus Christ. To save us from his wrath. So in order for God to save us from his wrath, I said, he's got to take us out of here. So again, these are some of the principles that we'll talk about. Next week we'll get into why is, it, why is hermeneutics so important for a leader, for a pastor, for one of your leaders. If the leader doesn't know how to interpret scripture, then you can be sure that eventually the whole lump will be leavened. That's why you hear me say things about doctrine. That's why you hear me say things when people say stupid stuff publicly. I correct it. You know, when we had that pastor come and he, and he said that the body of Christ is the fourth member of the Godhead. <laughs> okay, I, and I called him on it. I called him at home and I said, I need you to explain this to me. I listened to the tape six or seven times, and I couldn't believe you said what you said. Now, you need to explain to me what you mean. And he explained it, and he took the scripture right out of, of the book of um, the Psalms, and he misinterpreted that scripture uh, like you wouldn't believe. And I asked him, I said, so you're saying that the scripture says, no, you're not, that you are God's? that you believe that we are gods and that we are fourth member of the Godhead and use that scripture? And I asked him a very simple question. I said, what does the word in Hebrew, gods, mean? And he could not answer me because he didn't know because he never looked it up. But I had. Even before this I had. That's why I knew it. And I says, know you not that ye are judges? It has nothing about deity being worshipped and being part of the fourth member of the Godhead. And I told him, I said, what you're teaching is heresy. And he said, well, Dad Hagen is what, that's what he, I said, I don't care if it's Dad Hagen, Mama Hagen, Grandpa Hagen, whoever it is. Okay. That's, that's heresy. And then someone else in our church came and tried to tell me that the Holy Spirit's not a person. I said, are you serious? How do we know he's a person? How did God communicate to us the teaching about the Holy Spirit? Did he use abstract? Or did he teach, he shall glorify me, for he shall not speak of himself, but that which he hears, well, only a person can hear, only a person can be grieved, only a person can be quenched, in that sense, so we know the Holy Spirit is not a it, it's not a thing, it's not a power, it's a person. It's a 
person. So these are some of the things you'll get to better understand. I just want to write where I'm going to leave off right here so I know. Are there any questions? You finding it interesting? Huh? See how thick my book is? We didn't get to Flavius Josephus yet, but we will. Any questions? Yes. I'm going through that right now. If you follow, if you follow, it's not going to be word for word, but it's going to be, it's right there. About hermeneutics, the word, what does it, what does it mean? You're going to, you're going to find that. Yes. What we're going to, what we're going through right now is the first four, the first four, uh, first four lessons. Huh? Right. Just go, yeah, just go to the, uh, it's going to be kind of difficult to, because I've added a lot of stuff in here that's not in there. I want it to be a part of my own personal uh, input too. So um, I would say just read chapter one. That's your work, that's your homework assignment. Read chapter one. You'll find that you'll find a lot of the, the um, Greek, Greek words that are used there and more in depth. I can't go in depth. If I went into depth, we'd be here for, uh, for three years. Okay? But I don't want to stay that long on this. I want to be able to have the, the 24 weeks or whatever it's going to be uh, to get this, get through that. That's it's almost half a year. So we'll try to cover, try to cover about a chapter a week. But we'll see. But that's what these books are for. These books are for, not just to have me go through it and then you go stick it on your shelf. This is for you to go and to, to read it and study it. You know, I've got a lot of my own personal notes in there of when I studied it and went through it. And, and you're going to find about different things, like you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna learn about the first mention principle. You see that on, on, uh, in uh, Chapter 7, right? Which actually in my teaching is Chapter 6, I think. Because we, they added an appendix or something, they added something in there. Um, but the uh, the first the first mentioned principle, who knows what that is? Does anybody know that? Maybe a couple of you know because you might have had it before. First mentioned principle, you don't know what it is. Does anybody know what that is? Huh? First mentioned principle in scripture. Uh -huh. Just a little hint. What it is is that if a scripture mentions something one time somewhere else, it usually follows all the way through the same meaning in scripture. Give you an example. Re Revelation chapter 12, I forget what verse it is. It talks about a woman. And I've, I've sought many commentaries on that and Many of the new commentaries and the new thinking is that the woman is the church. Well, if you're a post-tribulationist, you've got to have the church sticking around after chapter 4. So you make Israel, remember I said earlier, they make Israel the church. So the woman there, they say, is, is, is the church. And I said, well, it can't be the church. And they say, well, why can't it be? I said, because of the principle of first mention. And they go, what are you talking about? Well, the principle of first mention is this. If it's mentioned somewhere else in Scripture, you've got to hold through all the way through to the end, right? What was, what, was, what was one of the characteristics of this woman in Revelation? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Run around her head. Remember? Read it in, in Revelation chapter 12, right? You see it says the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay? Go back in Exodus. Uh, go back in Genesis. When Joseph had his dream, remember he had a dream? And he said he saw the sun and the moon and the stars pay obeisance to him. And when he told his father that, he went to slap him across the head. 
And he said, Joseph, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren bow down to thee? So the sun and the moon and the stars in Joseph's dream was in reference to who? Israel. Right? Jacob, the mother and father, and the brethren, the sons of Israel. So when you go back into Revelation now, the proper interpretation of the woman is Israel. That's the principle of first mentioned example. Amen? Praise the Lord. Any other questions? Comments? Rebukes? Well, Father, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, help us to get through this study and help us to be a, a better workmen, interpreting your word and rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.